Hey, welcome back to GoGlam, Generous and Open Galleries, Libraries, Archives and Museums. Um, it's time for our next speaker. Uh, so our next speaker is Claire Rilla. Um, Claire has a pretty amazing background. Um, she did her PhD in archaeology and was the first arts doctorate at the University of Sydney to have an online database accepted as an appendix uh, to her PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Uh, Claire has worked with Indigenous groups in many parts of the world as well as with museums and other organisations in the GLAM sector and she now works at Catalyst IT Australia helping out with a range of different things, apparently. Um, Claire's also Secretary of the Australasian Chapter of the Computer Applications and Quantitative Methods in Archaeology. So, uh, she's going to tell us all about um, appropriation of culture and, um, you know, ethical, glam, tech stuff. So, uh, please make her welcome. <laughs> Um, the Yugambeh people, who are the traditional owners of this area. Um, I'd also like to say thanks to Arnett for providing the Wi-Fi that we all enjoy <laughs> when we're at the conference. <laughs> right, so as you said, I'm going to be talking about issues in data management um, and focus a little bit on some of the ethical issues that I feel sometimes get forgotten in the glam sector around this sort of stuff. So... I was quite pleased to find this picture that says, big data is watching you. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Okie dokie. So when we think about issues in cultural heritage data management, we're used to thinking of like the stuff on the far left over there, um, huge volumes of data. Uh, in archaeology, we often have LIDAR data, 3D rendering, all that kind of jazz, so quite large volumes of data to deal with. File formats... Everybody's got that old piece of research that's in some form, funky format that you're not really sure whether you can read anymore and what do we do with it? Or somebody's retiring and you discover they've got all these three-quarter inch floppy disks with all their notes on it. Uh, so those are all very real issues, as is the continuing issue of storage. Uh, but I want to jump across to some of the stuff on the right, which is kind of comes out of the increasing need to enhance visitor engagement and online delivery of the data. And these are issues around those subjects there, which we're going to look at in more detail. Um, so I apologize to any of you who do know very well the definitions of what I'm going to cover, but I've discovered that surprising people don't. So I'm just going to cover everything anyway. Um, I first wanted to mention that there is actually a very strong connection between the GLAM sector and open source, and that comes right from the top with UNESCO, who in 2015 were recommending strongly the use of open source software and actually encouraging people, particularly software and hardware developers, to extract data and content from proprietary technologies and instead go to open source. And the reasons around that were the ones you can see on the left that um, it's generally regarded as more secure and it's more future-proof. If you are in a proprietary system and the vendor decides to stop supporting it, bang, you know, you're kind of left floating with all your data in something that nobody else knows anything about. Um, whereas at least with open source solutions, you can, somebody else can pick it up and help you out. And a lot of this has led to um, the glam sector. I've put an example there from the very popular website of the Tate Modern Gallery, which receives millions of visitors a year, and their actual physical visitor numbers have also grown hugely as a result of their admittedly very engaging website. And this has led glam organisations to look at the software as a service kind of options and the use, increasing use of the cloud. So one of the first things I want to address is the idea of data sovereignty. The definition is there. It's basically making sure that data stays within national boundaries. 
And that means that the servers holding the data are actually physically located within those geographical boundaries. And then it's got a side issue of whether or not the hosting company is under obligation to hand over that data to foreign governments or not and under what circumstances. And it all revolves around this court case that you may have heard of, Microsoft versus the United States. It started in 2013 when the US government issued a warrant for some email which was on datas, Microsoft datas that were actually in Ireland. And Microsoft said that the warrant didn't cover the data because it was in Ireland. Um, they took it to the district court. The district court judge ruled that a US warrant has no territorial limitations, which is lovely. <laughs> um, Microsoft appealed to the US Court of Appeals, who overturned it and found for Microsoft. The US Department of Justice then appealed to the US Supreme Court about this case. There were similar things happening in other areas at the time. As I say, they, they were also trying to force Google to hand over some data in 2017. This went on for years, as this kind of stuff does. And basically, everyone was stalling for time while they managed to get this act passed. And the lawyers just had such a fun time. On that day, they thought they were just so cool because they called it the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data the Cloud Act. I mean, how sweet is that? Which basically says that it's the country under which the company is, is um, you know, the jurisdiction that the company's in that matters. It doesn't matter where the physical data is stored. Um, so a new warrant was then issued under that act and Microsoft then complied with that warrant, having had the situation clarified. Now, in this instance, the whole hoo-ha was about drug trafficking emails. Um, but obviously, as we all know, sitting in this room, that could be anything, okay? It, if you're using Gmail, it could be your email, it could be any of the data that you store there. So. If you're using AWS, yes, the servers may be in Australia, but AWS in the States may be lent on. So there are implications. It's worth at least knowing. There's often not a lot we can do about it, um, but it's at least worth knowing the circumstances. Now, um, I personally prefer the term memory organizations to glam institutions, <laughs> just say. <laughs> so what does this mean for our memory organizations? Well, there's increasing use of cloud hosting and software as a service. Um, if you're going to be storing that data with a um, hosting provider that is foreign owned, especially based in the US, be aware what that actually means. Most of the time it's fine. But if the US government decides, then you know they may have to hand it over. Also, when we're working with researchers, you know, we often want to send some data over to a, a subject matter expert in a different country. That's then leaving the jurisdiction of Australia and going into a different jurisdiction. Be aware of that. Um, you may not have any control over what happens to that data once it goes. You may trust that person, absolutely. They're just doing their job. But it will be physically sitting wherever. And also implications for long-term data storage, obviously. There are people who will have perspectives on this, and I just put some pictures up there of them. <laughs> because while we're making all these grand decisions about where we're storing our data, um, something I'm going to come to is the question of who are the stakeholders in this and who actually owns the data. Right. Then I came across this concept of data colonialism. Now, we've all heard of colonialism. We all know what that was around and generally regarded as not one of history's finer moments. Um, and there's some arguments about whether it's ended at all. Uh, data colonialism takes that a step further. So there's a definition of colonialism up the top there, standard definition. I love that picture. To me, that picture, you know, you don't need to explain colonialism when you've got that picture. <laughs> Winston Churchill's Memoirs of his trip to Africa, right there. <laughs> um, okay, so what's data colonialism? 
basically, anywhere where there's an asymmetric power relationship and where people are dispossessed of their data. Hello, social media. Right? So the argument that has been made in these papers, and I strongly urge you to read some of these papers on the subject if you have any interest in this area, um, we are all in the process of actually being colonized right now because companies like Facebook and all the other big social media platforms do whatever they like with our data and they don't always ask us. Um, as we know, Facebook got into a lot of trouble for doing experiments on people. Ooh, what happens if I put only negative uh, comments and things, if I feed through only the negative stuff onto somebody's feed? How does that impact their medical health? They were running all these sorts of experiments on the average user because their argument is when you sign that license agreement that's 12 pages long and who reads them anyway, you agree that they can do that. Um, and of course, we don't have to go into the whole saga of Cambridge Analytics and influencing elections and all that kind of jazz. So in lots of ways, a lot of the stuff we do every single day, think about that process. Um, this is why I called it the appropriation of culture, because our data is actually being appropriated by these companies for their own purposes. And as we know, companies are not people. If you do a psychological assessment of companies, they generally come out as psychotic. So these are not organizations that are going to make fluffy, friendly decisions that are in your best interest. No, it's all about the bottom line and what they can do with that. And sometimes they seem to run on a bit of a kind of power trip. <laughs> hey, we've got all this. What can we do with it? So there's actually implications for all of us in this. Um, as part of the Facebook license agreement, you agree to share copyright of any images you upload onto Facebook with Facebook. So they then have copyright of everything that's in there. Worth bearing in mind, especially if you're working with cultural heritage data, especially if you're dealing with indigenous data. A lot of the people who uh, have a relationship with those images may not be thrilled that the copyright of that image is now sitting with a US company. Location services, we all know that you can now, you know, track who's where. Um, I actually had this conversation with my kids because we were using Google Maps to navigate at some point and my daughter asked me, but mummy, how do they know where the cars are? And I said, no, sweetheart, they don't know where the cars are. They're tracking the Android phones. That's how they know what the traffic's doing. So now they actually know that. And now when we're coming up to an intersection and it's red on the map, they go, oh, look, there's lots of Android phones ahead. <laughs> um, basically, our lives are becoming more and more digital. And there are huge ethical implications around that, which we're only starting to kind of think about in small ways. There need to be bigger discussions about this. Because I'm an archaeologist and because I talk a lot about um, the spreading of humans across the world and the exchange of human genetic material to, between different parts of the world and, and how we're all related and we're all anatomically modern humans, people are always asking me, oh, have you done your DNA analysis and found out who you're related to? I would love to. I think that stuff is brilliant. I think it's just fantastic. I do not trust any single one of those companies to look after their databases properly, so no. <laughs> um, similarly, digitally born works, uh, a whole new range, as we heard a little bit already this morning, and I'm here, we're sure we'll hear some more, a whole new range of issues. Um, the UN is actually now talking about the need to preserve the carrier as well as the data. Um, so there's a whole range of stuff around that. So basically, how can we avoid the impacts of the appropriation of all this data on our lives? And, you know, we don't want to get to that dystopian future that we've read about in all those books where we don't control anything anymore. There are further implications for organisations, particularly ones that deal with cultural heritage data, particularly those that deal with indigenous cultural heritage data. 
we don't want to further the process of colonialism. Many of the indigenous people who have entrusted items of cultural heritage to our organizations have had very negative experiences of colonialism. We don't want to continue that. Uh, we want to show that we respect the data that we hold and curate. We also want to be respectful of the privacy of the visitors. So whilst we want to have that funky, fantastic new website that's going to make our organisation the hottest thing on the web this year, um, we can do that while still remaining respectful of the people who are visiting that site. And we need to be aware that, yep, colonialism is still going on, just in different forms. So ask questions. You know, where will this stuff be hosted? Um, where is my data actually going when I do this particular project or um, when we do this thing? And what could possibly happen to it? Start thinking about worst case scenarios. You, know, you don't want to discover that actually it showed up in a court case on the other side of the world when you didn't know that it had left the country. And this is a quote from Ben Dekry <laughs> from a few years back. There is no cloud, there is only someone else's computer. And we need to be very aware of that when we're making plans to store our data. And yeah, when we're putting stuff on social media platforms. So let's look at the question of ownership. Because there's often an idea that, sure, the original owners of the cultural heritage stuff in museums or art galleries or the other institutions were the people who made it. But now they've given it to us to curate. And if we take a photo of that, that's got nothing to do with them. Really? They might not think that. Okay. I've heard Aboriginal people speak at conferences about experiencing a level of shock that actually almost physically incapacitated them when they walked into a museum storage area and saw all of their people on the shelves. Okay. There are cultures for whom the objects are not separate from people. The objects absorb the part of the personality of the people, they become people themselves. Those objects, in their view, need to be treated with the same respect as we would treat a human being. And so it's a very visceral shock to them when they see people just casually tossing stuff in a bucket or you know, throwing it out of a cardboard box or whatever. Similarly, you can't just waltz up to an indigenous person and take their photograph in many cultures. That's not cool. They feel the same way about the objects. If they open their social media feed and see a picture of a necklace that belonged to one of their grandparents, that can be a really shocking thing for someone like that. Um, so those are issues that we need to be aware of. They would see that they have a level of ownership in any of the data that is produced from any of the cultural heritage information. There isn't the same sort of separation that we make. So over here we have an Aboriginal elder telling the story uh, related to the pigeon in this particular area of land. That story is part of that land. The rhythms of the story actually represent the landforms in that area. If we record that story, we're recording that land in a format that those people will still feel connected to, and we need to show respect for that. As I've shown here, just because of the fact we put it in an in a display case in a museum uh, with a sign saying what it is, doesn't distance it uh, from people necessarily, which is great. It's great that they still feel connected to those objects. We need to work with that and we need to find ways that that can be a positive experience for everyone involved. Because there are lots of ways that once we start working together, we can actually get to a whole new place that we didn't realize um, with a lot of advantages we didn't see before. And there's just some questions to think about. Who does own the data? The person analysing it? Um, the person whose heritage it comes from? The broader community? The colonial organisation or people that are holding on to it? Uh, the youth who are going to need it 
in future generations, the organisations that are actually doing the day-to-day -day curation, or the social media platforms on which it's shared. Maybe there's a little bit of everybody in there. Very similar to this is the whole concept of access and dissemination. So as I said, if you casually take a photo of a cultural heritage object and share it on social media, that is actually a process that might need some negotiation, particularly if it's suddenly sharing copyright, um, if it's going to end up in a law court, uh, if it's going to end up being discussed by lawyers completely out of everybody's hands. How are Indigenous people going to actually interact with all that stuff that we put online? Over there, we've got a young chap from Brazil who's come into a computer centre to look up something that's of relevance to him. We've got students, we've got people in the community working on projects. How is that data going to be used? Who by and in what circumstances? And when we think about these ideas of ownership and access and dissemination of cultural heritage data, we want to be very sure that we manage security appropriately. And when we're managing data security and issues around that, we're thinking of this chap down here, okay? The hacker who's trying to get to stuff. We forget about Mandy in accounting who might have the right to delete everything because that's part of her job to clean up stuff. And she's not a hacker, she has no evil intent. She just sees a whole lot of files labeled my file number one, two, three, and she goes, what the heck's that? Gone. Um, you know, think about who has access to it, under what circumstances, who can change it, who can delete it, who can get to it. Um, who decides how it's stored and for how long? And who needs to be part of that conversation? Perhaps you actually need to get the indigenous people in to actually start talking about these issues. Um, what would they like to be involved in? You might be surprised in some of the things they might like to be involved in. And it's all about building up a relationship of trust because once you actually start working with people, our fellow humans, and you sit down and you demystify the whole process and you become humans just working together, it becomes a lot easier to trust. Even if you've had several hundred years of being shafted by people in government organisations, um, you can actually discover that there's just a human being sitting on the other side of the table. And then those relationships of trust can actually lead to, as I said, whole new directions for projects and places to go. OK, long-term planning. Um, it is abundantly clear to anyone working in the area that we are in a climate that is changing and that our long-term planning needs to include provision for things like floods and bushfires and even something that we never planned for, coronal mass ejections, major solar flares. There was one that happened in the 19th century, which if it happened today would take out absolutely all the electronics we have. So just stop and think about that for a moment. If you ever <laughs> want to stay awake for a long time, <laughs> our very first problem there actually is water because there is no supply of water to any of our cities that does not rely on electronics. So at that point, society starts to break down really fast. OK, so we're used to planning for disaster events. We also need to plan um, for working with people over the long term. So our long term planning might need to include lots and lots of discussion. It might need to include actually talking to indigenous people who have a relationship to the cultural heritage stuff that we look after and ask them about which bits of data they want to be involved with, how they want the management of that data and the dissemination of that data to uh, be undertaken, what they're happy with seeing, how they want that to work for their community um, and start a dialogue. They also want to often keep interacting with that material and that can be very powerful. Um, often we have stuff that sits in shelves that nothing happens with for a long time. And there might be communities that actually want to keep using that uh, and keep it alive. And that can be a really easy way to foster these relationships, is allow people access to actually use that material on a regular basis. <laughs> 
And then I just quickly wanted to run through a couple of things I found in a very interesting paper on um, the general public's expectations. In this case, it was to do with museums, but one of them was an art museum, so it, it crosses over a range of institutions. Um, about leaving comments. So this was comments in books, visitors' books, and also online comments. And it's really interesting because it, it shows a cross-section of society of the sorts of information that people are prepared to share, um, which is quite interesting in terms of how we look after the privacy of the people visiting our organizations. So interestingly, and a lot of people were willing to leave their name, but didn't really care about reading the name of somebody who was leaving a comment. <laughs> For me, the really interesting one is age, because there you've got very high percentages both of people wanting to know the age of the person reading the comment and being willing to leave it themselves. Um, and that leads into a whole discussion of how would you collect that information because there's a whole lot of privacy stuff around collecting uh, information around age. It can be as simple as when you're leaving a comment, type in your age. And if the person wants to lie, yay. You know, they want to say they're 12, they want to say they're 64, whatever, who cares? It doesn't matter. We can keep that separate from a user login area where we might actually need to know more detail about them, perhaps the actual year of their birth. Keep it to a minimum when we're trying to get this information. If we can store the minimum amount of information, if you want to have it automatically generate the age, just store the year. You don't need to know the exact birthday. It solves a whole lot of issues down the track if that, when that data leaks out. Um, so interesting patterns there. Next, how long should the comments be kept? Um, there's a high expectation of indefinitely. Okay, That means that there's a lot of onus on us to actually look at storing this stuff if the public's expecting us to keep that stuff long term. Um, how long do you think they're actually kept is now separated out between um, whether it's in a digital format or not. So people expect that if you're just leaving rough notes, they're going to be chucked out. Whereas if it's in digital, if it's a digital comment, they, they really expect it to be kept. And then what's done with those comments? Pretty much everyone is okay. Well, not everyone, but a large number of people are okay with those comments being used um, on the website which is really interesting for those of us looking at websites with these uh, organizations. So as we can see there, 29% say it's absolutely fine with no caveats, and another 59% if it's anonymized. So that's massive. On the other end of the scale, the thing that everybody doesn't want to happen is print it on a mug and sell it in the shop. <laughs> And finally, um, do you have notices around what is going to happen to that comment? Overwhelmingly, yes. Okay, People want to see, if you're collecting comments, what are those comments going to be used for? And um, if there was a comment that, if there was a notice telling you exactly what that comment's going to be used for, would it put you off from actually making a comment? The answer is mostly no. So it's all about collaboration. It's all about working together. Um, we work with a lot of different bits of society. We've got um, the organizations themselves, the, the memory organizations. We've got the technology experts that come in to help. We've got the indigenous people whose cultural material might be in that organization. We've got the broader community that we want to engage with that information. So this is what we need to consider. What data do we actually need to collect? Um, where and how are we going to store it? What sort of access do we need to allow? And that may, may differ by the, the groups that we're dealing with. And we need to know when they'll need access and, and what purposes. And who do we actually need to consult with? And this might be a broader range than we used to. My watchword on that is 
like mo a lot of other things, if you're going to do consultation early and often. Okay, the earlier you get people involved, the more transparent the process, the more they will believe that you're actually trying to do something real. If you call them in and say, we've got this entire project that we spent 20 million on, and it's going to roll out next week, and we just want you okay, they're like, why am I even here? Okay. If you sit down and you say, hey, we want to do something really great with this stuff, and we know that you guys are connected to the stuff that we've got here, have you got any thoughts? You've probably got them on board from the beginning. Be aware of what's happening with your own personal data. Okay. This is not just a process that happens out there somewhere. It happens to all of us all the time. Every time we're on our phone, every time we're talking about what we're doing, every time we're looking at social media, every time we're sharing stuff, every time we've got that little location thing on, on our phone, it's happening to you. And yeah, build these long-term relationships because the more you have that long-term relationship, the more stuff you're gonna be allowed to do. Um, as I've said, there, there are Aboriginal groups that I know of who are working closely with archaeologists that they've worked with for a very long time, that they're actually allowing those archaeologists to take samples from the um, skeletal material in their areas to run genetic studies on um, the ancestry of those groups, which is something you would think would be entirely impossible given the... Um, very strong feelings about deceased persons in a lot of Aboriginal cultures and the very strong taboos against going anywhere near any of that material. It's just mind boggling that they would actually get to the point where they trust someone enough to allow them that level of access to conduct that analysis. And that's what can happen if you just sit down and talk and you actually get people on board and build those relationships. So ask, you might be surprised by the answers. And then very quickly, I just wanted to whip through an example um, to bring it into something in the real world that's easier to relate to. This is a project that I worked on when I was in Bahrain. Um, it was a nomination for a World Heritage Site. And we built up a database that was very interactive for people to use. Um, had maps and timelines and linked a lot of the information that we were dealing with in the nomination so that it was then accessible for people to use. And as a result, people were able to actually interact, the locals who lived in those houses that were part of the World Heritage Site were able to actually interact with their own history. They were able to add to it and bring out, hey, I've got a picture of my grandfather who lived in this house. Let's add that. And so we actually added the chap and his grandfather. <laughs> um, and actually you start to give information and interact. And that brought a feeling of ownership so the local people felt like they were actually part of that process that was going on. And finally, acknowledgements. I really do believe that the traditional owners of the country have had enormous amount of patience and that we would do very well to start honouring their patience. Um, I'd like to thank Catalyst for sponsoring me to be here and I try to use public domain pictures wherever possible and acknowledge we're not. And then to my colleagues, all of us are struggling to get to a more useful place <laughs> in the world. So thanks to everybody for their efforts.